Here we go. Okay, great. Good morning. Um, my name is Brian Bouters, and I'm a developer with the Pulp Team. And uh, this session is really all about kind of the current state of high availability. Um, I'm using some slides that I had developed <clears throat> back when Pulp Core 314 was developed, uh, was released. So um, that was really the release that we um, fully, you know, accomplished high availability uh, in, um, in with Pulp. So um, that's why the title reads this way. But really, this whole session is about high availability, um, the state of it, and how it can be used. And I also want to point out that uh, I'm going to be sharing this session um, with Mike DePaulo, who works very much with the installer. Um, so after this slide deck, he's going to show us a little bit about um, the installer. Um, Mike, if, if you're here, maybe you want to just introduce yourself for a moment. I think he said he'd be back in a few minutes. Indeed, um, perfect. Well, he can introduce himself when we transition after this slide deck. So um, <clears throat> feel free to unmute and ask any questions or share any comments. You don't need to wait till the end. And if you're watching this later on YouTube, feel free to leave questions down below and we'll try to answer those. So uh, this is not as pretty an architecture diagram as Tanya draws, um, <clears throat> but uh, Strangely, I made these in LibreOffice, and then LibreOffice now will not open those files. So I had to cut a PDF, and this is just the state of things. Um, this is a 314 architecture diagram. And uh, in the top section here, there's a reverse proxy. So this is either um, an Apache or Nginx. You could also use other reverse proxies, like if you're on Kubernetes. Um, you can use Ingress there, for example, something like that. Um, and with Pulp Core 314, that reverse proxy needs to proxy to two services. So there's Pulp Core API, this serves the Django um, portion of our application, and pretty much all the API calls um, end up being routed here. So this is routes like slash pulp slash API slash v3. Um, so uh, that's the that's this part here. And then um, Pulp Core content. It serves the content or will redirect you to S3. And it serves URLs like slash pulp slash content, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and uh, let's just talk about these services first. Um, notice that there's kind of like one, two, and N um, boxes drawn inside of there because uh, you can have, you can horizontally scale each of these points. And that's kind of what this one, two to N. Um, it, uh, image is trying to convey. Uh, so, for example, at the web, at the reverse proxy level, you can have n number of reverse proxies, and you could set them up into different, for example, availability zones, like one in uh, Amazon region northeast, one in Amazon region west. And the idea is that if there's a massive power outage, one of those is still going to stay online. So uh, similarly with the Pulp Core API, it's the same same kind of a, a thing here, horizontally scalable. And uh, you can have n number of API processes. And as long as your reverse proxy is routing to all the available processes, then uh, you will um, you'll receive high availability if you put the Pulp Core API processes in their own availability zones. If, if you I mean, you can start a whole lot of processes on one box, for instance. That's not high availability. So the trick here, uh, this is a logical diagram, but what it's not is a physical diagram showing the separation and spreading of these n number of processes across different um, areas. Uh, we will be um, looking at a diagram that shows them spread out a little, a little bit later. Similarly for pulp core content, um, you can have n number of these processes. Mike, would you be able to mute uh, for a little bit? Um, yeah. N number of these processes and uh, you know, your reverse proxy should route to the ones that are available and spread them out in the different avail availability zones. Uh, they all talk to a clustered file system. This itself needs to be highly available. Pulp does not, um, you know, our focus is Pulp, not um, you know, uh, totally administering setting up and managing clustered file systems. That's not our mission and dedication. So uh, users are expected to set up highly available clustered file systems here. Um, 
Another alternative is to use object storage, which if you're really going for HA is probably a better option. Um, this clustered file system can also be replaced with S3 um, or an S3 similar um, object storage. And I believe we also support um, Azure as a object storage backend. Or you can use something like Ceph um, as an open source alternative, which provides a S3 um, mimic mimic to API. So that's also an option. Um, also over here is the um, Postgres server. So here, this needs to be highly available as well. Same kind of a approach here. We're not focused on um, setting up and deploying highly available Postgres servers. That's a, that's a responsibility for whoever's deploying pulp. Um, likely, if you're really needing HA, uh, you probably already have one of these in your um, enterprise. So uh, you need this component to be highly available in order for this to the whole system to be highly available. Um, and lastly, this box here are the pulp core workers. Notice that they only speak with the with Postgres and with the clustered file system. There's no direct network connections between pulp core worker and the other um, the other components. So it doesn't speak directly to the web server. It doesn't speak directly to pulp core API or pulp core content. Everything gets kind of put into the database and and the file system and read in and out of that. So. Similarly here, though, you want one through N pulp core workers. Um, I want to talk a little bit about high availability and capacity. Um, high availability is the, the, really the goal of this talk, but um, most people also want to enjoy additional throughput and capacity, uh, which can come together with high availability. So I just want to call out, um, if you horizontally scale pulp core content, the more processes that are here, the more um, content serving you'll have. So if you have a system that's, for example, struggling to serve, say, like 50,000 clients or 5,000 clients or some large number of machines which are trying to fetch content, um, like Yum DNF or um, Ansible Galaxy CLIs or something like that, um, you probably want to scale this component. and. Uh, if you put them in the in independent availability zones, you'll be getting high availability. But even if you don't do that, um, you'll be receiving more uh, content serving throughput by horizontally scaling this component. Uh, that's the pulp core content component. Um, here with pulp core API, this is all about API calls. So if you have um, a large number of API calls occurring, then you would probably want to have more of these. Um, in practice, the binary content that flows over pulp is probably a thousand to one larger than the pulp core API calls. So it's likely that you won't need a very large number of pulp core API calls. Um, that is to say, I think it would be difficult to saturate this component um, relative to how easy it would be to saturate the pulp core content component. That would be quite simple um, because binary data is just large and um, these processes are consumed as they serve that binary data. Um, pulp core workers, uh, this is the tasking system backend. So when you perform a sync or a publish, publication um, creation or um, copy operations, all, all the things that are longer running tasks where you get the 202 responses from the API, those are all processed by pulp core workers. And so uh, you'll, if you want to be able to sync more repositories concurrently, you'll want more pulp core workers. And you should just be able to add more and more and more of these and get more and more and more throughput. Um, there's a diminishing returns effect there, um, but it's um, pretty linear, uh, I would say. Certainly up to like 32 and N of 32. And I think I've heard from Douglas that he uses 42, which of course is the answer. Um, that, uh, you know, those are the kinds of scales that you'll see here in Pulp Core Workers. Um, any comments or questions before we leave this slide? It's a lot of content for this one dinky picture. Feel free to unmute if there are. Um, so how do you deploy? The question I, uh, I'm trying to answer here with this slide is, OK, so how do you deploy these things in a way that's reasonable to manage? Because yes, you could start putting processes all over the everywhere in like Amazon East and Amazon West and they're in the different parts of your data center one and data center two, whatever. 
Um, but uh, that can get really complicated. So you can arrange these in a lot of different ways. This is one arrangement that I recommend. And um, the idea here is make every node the same. <laughs> that way you don't have to manage a lot of different things. So in this case, um, this is a three host uh, cluster for pulp and the web server, which this is again, the reverse proxy. Um, so either Apache or Nginx uh, is speaking to it's a single pulp core API process and a single pulp core content process. Um, and this is all happening on local host. And the pulp core workers, they only interact with the Postgres servers and the cluster file system or object storage. So they, they're they going to make network connections off the box at all times anyways. So um, they kind of self-organize and self-discover. All you have to do is start them and point them at the database and it's all good. So um, this, is a con this is my recommended deployment because um, it's it's good for a couple reasons. One, like I said, it, you don't have to manage a lot of different images. But two, um, the what you need to do here is load balance the incoming traffic to the reverse proxies. And you can do this with either um, a proper load balancer like HA proxy, or you can do it with my favorite load balancing technique, which is DNS-based load balancing, where your you know my, pulp.example.com is the, the site that everyone uses to access it. And the DNS records are handed out round robin. So it's like, oh, for the first person who requests the resolution, they get redirected to, not, not HTTP redirected, they get DNS resolved to host1.example.com to the IP address that pairs with this. Um, and the second host will get this one and the third host will get this one. But whether you use DNS load balancing or um, it's your proxy in front of this whole get up. The, the important part is that um, as those things are routing traffic probably in a round robin fashion or maybe in a maybe in a way that routes traffic based on the nearest servers, which is something that for instance like route 53 will do, which is a Amazon's DNS service. Um, so that's like a geo based routing. Um, either way, the trick is to make sure that, you monitor these boxes that they're online and that you're only routing traffic to those boxes that are online. So you probably want to have the HA proxy monitoring the status endpoint specifically from host1.example.com, host2.example.com, host3.example.com. And then if there's a um, availability degradation, the um, HA proxy would just stop routing traffic. For instance, if host3 were to have an outage and go down, stop routing traffic there. And you'll have to do something similar if you're doing DNS-based load balancing. But that's a better situation than trying to put load, ba like load balancing on multiple points in this kind of an architecture. And again, this is a logical diagram. But um, by putting these things on local hosts, you don't have to load balance in front of pulp core API as like a set of boxes and pulp core content as a set of boxes. And that's why I really recommend this deployment. Um, also, you know, you, everything you deploy, you kind of get more of everything. So you don't necessarily have to think too hard about, um, you know, what do I need more of? And from a capacity perspective and a throughput perspective, um, that's kind of good and bad. Like you could end up starting an absurd number of pulp core workers when really what you need are a bunch more pulp core content, but hopefully you, you get the idea here. Um, here's a web server config example. Uh, in the, um, this defines kind of a cluster of, um, in, in the reverse proxy. So this would be um, an example for Nginx specifically, which uh, I think I'm wearing an Nginx shirt. But um, there's similar things for Apache. Uh, this defines kind of a group of hosts, which are referred to collectively as pulp-content. And as the reverse proxy routes things to them, um, it will route them you know, in a round robin fashion. Uh, this is not really what I recommend doing. It's just an example of like, hey, here's how reverse proxy configs work with clustered backend services. Because um, what I was really recommending back on this previous slide was have every reverse proxy just route things to localhost. That would just be 
easier. But if you did want to have a reverse proxy that routed to n number of pulp content processes or pulp API processes, this is an example of what you would find in the config. And you'll see in, in the pulp installer, and maybe Mike can explain this a little bit more, but you'll see in the pulp installer that there's a block that looks like this and it just doesn't have, and there are ways to configure the installer to have it have more, uh, have it have more entries here. So, but there's a block typically like a normal pulp install for a single machine will have a block like this and it'll just have a single entry. Um, configuring the web servers, uh, this, there's a section in the documentation which I'm, my screen sharing is locked to this window, not a web server window. So I'm not gonna necessarily go there, but um, there's the shared variable section here and there's pulp that underscore API bind and pulp underscore content bind. And these are the uh, web server, these are the um, installer Ansible variables that you can use to set uh, those sorts of configurations. Um, I talked a little bit about this already. Uh, more pulp core workers, you get more tasking throughput. Uh, more pulp core API services, you get more concurrent API requests. Um, that's everything that goes to like slash pulp slash, a, uh, slash pulp slash API slash v3. Um, more pulp core content, you'll get more content serving. That's everything with slash pulp slash content or a few other things, a few other URLs as well for different content types that need different sorts of URLs. Um, of all these things, you probably want to scale the pulp core dash content and the pulp core dash workers more than pulp core dash API. Uh, we talked a little bit about this one as well. Um, only route API and content requests to live services. Um, you probably want to determine if they're live by looking at the status API specifically on each host. Um, and workers auto organize. And at worst case, you'll get one canceled task. And I'm not even sure if that's the case anymore. Um, but uh, the tasking system work from um, Matthias and uh, Daniel and other contributors. Um, thank you, Deborah, so much for helping us test all this. Uh, is really slick. So it's a, the workers basically just take care of themselves. Um, even in the event of failure scenarios, you'll you'll get likely um, at most one canceled task. Uh, where's Redis in three fourteen? Notice the Redis wasn't in my diagram. So Redis is still in the architecture, um, but it's only used for caching speed ups for content serving. Um, pulp can be configured not to use it. Uh, we're trying to improve that area right now, actually, um, to be able to handle like Redis outages and things like that. So, um, but those I would say fall in the category of bugs, and they'll be fixed very soon, if not fully fixed already. Um, but the the point is, is that in the architecture diagram, Redis is still around. Our installer still install installs it by default. And if you have pulp configured, your content serving will serve faster because of caching. Um, the content app has to answer quite a bit of questions about which piece of content is the one for this distribution and inside there, and is the user authorized? And there's all these things that the content app has to do before it actually starts streaming the binary data. So the, um, the caching speedups help it answer all those questions more. Um, if it's asked the same question again, it will be able to answer it much, much faster. Really great job to Jared and Daniel um, for working on making Redis our content serving cache uh, speed up. Um, and we can now, uh, we should be able to work correctly with a cluster deployment of Redis. So um, if you cluster your Redis, if you want to use the caching speed ups and you cluster your Redis properly, Pulp should be able to work with that just fine. Um, so here's the uh, actual diagram. It's just like the first one, only now it has this clustered or not Redis down here in the corner. And um, the pulp core content, uh, and there should be another error here to pulp core API, but details in that area aren't that important for users. It's really a developer concern. But the point is, is that, yeah, Redis is still here. Uh, this is a look at less than 313 architecture diagram that used the kind of traditional tasking system. It has a resource manager. It requires a non-clustered Redis. It's not really the focus of this talk since everyone should be using the new style tasking system. So we're not even going to get into the differences because they're, they're not relevant. Um, tasking system throughput, um, big shout out to the great work from Matthias for putting these benchmarks together on top of the code that produced such great benchmarks. Uh, you can see here that uh, this bottom 
we talked about this a few days ago, actually, but uh, during his talk, which you can go watch that if you want more information about this, but this bottom diagram, I think really shows the differences between the old tasking system and the new tasking system. Um, you can see that when you add one, two, four, eight, 16 and 32 workers, the service time, which is the amount of time the tasks take um, from the moment they're created until the moment they're finished. So that includes the waiting time before they're started and the time that it took for them to run while they're running um, is mainly flat, which is not good because uh, what you want is the more workers you start, the quicker your tasks are resolved. And you can see here that when you start 32 workers versus one worker for a large number of tasks, I think this is 256 tasks dispatched immediately, um, the per, uh, the per task time drops to like a quarter of a second. Whereas with the old one, it's still up at like 80 seconds or something like that. I think these were very short tasks. And I think actually this is the total, um, the total time for the whole job to, to complete. Uh, so anyways, what I'm trying to get out here is that if you start more workers, you'll get more throughput and that's only with the new tasking system. And this is a little bit about some of the large motivations that we had for doing that among other reasons. Um, one of which is the old tasking system can never be highly available because it depends on a non-cluster Redis. Um, there's a demo. Uh, I'm actually not going to do the demo um, because I want to share the session with Mike and I think the information that he, uh, you know, all I was going to do is going to kill some processes and watch Paul keep working. I don't actually think that's that exciting. What I'd like to do instead is um, turn it over to Mike DiPaolo, um, the very excellent Mike DiPaolo, who is, I think, going to tell us um, a little bit more about how to practically speaking deploy these things. And um, uh, Mike, how about uh, you take it from here? How do you feel about that? Yep, uh, one second. OK, great. Yep. Uh... And Mike, um, if you feel like giving a, a, a very short introduction for yourself as well, um, I think that would yep. be great. Yep. Uh, yeah. Give me one second to share my screen. I'm ready to go now. Sure. So. Actually, hi everybody, I'm Mike DiPaolo. I'm Pulp's uh, service reliability engineer, which means that I, oops, which means instead of, uh, instead of, uh, it means that I'm a, like, kind of like a site reliability engineer that develops the deployment and install and orchestration slash installation mechanisms for, whereas they develop it for a, uh, a single customer, as the service reliability engineer, I'm developing it for every, potential customer or every potential user of Pulp. Um, this, I'm primarily working on the Pulp installer, which is written in Ansible. It's a collection of Ansible roles that can be used to install Pulp individually, to uh, install Pulp and completely orchestrate the server, such as installing the Postgres database, or can be integrated into a larger set of Ansible roles for defining your servers or data center. Um, this talk is going to be about the clustering and HA support in Pulp installer. And note that when I say clustering, I basically mean load balancing is implemented, but HA may uh, may not be yet. So this is what uh, pulp uh, normally uh, this is what pulp looks like with the simplest possible installation. Each of these uh, I, uh, these blue boxes, these components of pulp, or or, or say not components of pulp, but services that pulp installer can install could be on their own individual server slash container slash cloud instance slash vm or they could be all on the same uh single server um you know that you know the user uh first uh, uh you know, the user connects to the web server and as explained uh in, i think in brian's slide the web server uh uh, with our special config routes the host either the API server or the content server. It also, uh, and 
you know, and it talks to the workers uh, through Postgres or slash Redis. And note that uh, I did specify a plus DB conf, but that's really more of an implementation detail. It's just one special one node during this pub install uh, configures the database. It, it creates like the user account and the schema and the tables and everything. And we typically make that the API node just by convention. Um, it only needs to happen once, and it's basically just implementation detail from uh, the user's perspective, unless uh, from 90 99% of the time. Um, and note that the happy pulp user could be, you know, using like you know nine different possible content types, like pulp supports, each with their own client with their own client specific behavior. So here's. Uh, Here's, oh, so yeah, here's what Pulp, well, let me go to the simple example first. So let's say uh, Pulp's using a really uh, well, really knowledgeable client, uh, a, 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 or sorry, a client with a feature where it can perform the H, it can understand that there are multiple servers it can talk to, multiple Pulp servers slash uh, repo servers that it can talk to and understands that, hey, if one's down, I should try the other. Um, this is one simpler, relatively simple way of doing HA and pulp. Here you can see that the, you know, there's, uh, you know, the, the user talks to uh, either of the two or more, in, so it talks to uh, the two or more Nginx servers. That, the Nginx servers we specified in there, like for example, DNF supports this. So DNF is the, you know, the, the new version of YUM. It supports multiple servers and has failover methods to config. And when you pass it out repo file to your clients or write the uh, repo file to their clients on disk, the config for the repo, you can specify those failover mechanisms, and it, not just the multiple server names. So here, the uh, user have, the user is just using DNF, and they're talking, and the, the, that that repo file says connect to each of those Nginx servers with their own with their distinct host names. And then, as Brian explained, we use the uh, Nginx module called Upstream, which does high availability, not just cluster, not just load balance, but also high availability for to talk to the eight multiple API servers, the multiple and the multiple content servers. And can I stop you for one sec, Mike? Um, yes. The presentation I just noticed I can see it here, but I'm casting, I'm casting to, you know, I'm casting this session, and it's not it's not coming up as pinned um, for this. Oh, would you would you mind just try and re restarting that because it's it's there we go. This looks. Yeah, good. I think I know what happened. I think I. I think I pressed a button by accident. I was trying to dismiss notifications. Happens to happens to the best of us. No, it's perfect now. Thank you very much. No problem. Yeah. So here you can see that the uh, uh, the um, yeah. So this uh, I noticed I this in this slide I I made Postgres and Redis red rather than blue, and this indicates that they are not being managed by Pulp Installer. We're purposely for the CBL future at least decided not to implement high availability Postgres or Redis in the installer, only single node installs, as uh, seen on the uh, prior slide, uh, like that. Like there, there it is, you know, single node is blue and managed by installer. Whereas, you know, here the, the user would set up multiple Postgres nodes and multiple Redis nodes, and they will not be managed by an installer. It's, uh, you know, Directly, somebody could use separate uh, th third party roles for Postgres and Redis, and they could set up a cluster, and they would all have to do is pass variables to pulp installers, uh, pulp installers' roles to use them, like the host name and the port and all that. Um, but, you know, the point is this is great. You know, this is, this is clustering, which required load balancing and high availability. And those workers, those API nodes, those content nodes, those Nginx web servers, they can be scaled up and down with the pulp installer. You would, uh, you know, you would every time you add a new host, that you specify I'm going to run this role against this new host. That uh, you can, you can, you know, it, and you rerun the installer with the new host list. It gets added. It, uh, everything's been configured for it, including the. There's a variable I have to specify to the web server to understand which the API and content nodes are, but it's uh, you can do it like that. Um, and then, so here's the more complex scenario, but it's more commonly done because we can't assume that all nine content type clients support uh, HA. Uh, we have to have something intelligent in, uh, in between the user and uh, the web servers. So 
round uh, round robin DNS provides load balancing, but does not provide habitability. Brian already explained this. Uh, however, HA proxy or mini clouds equivalents things and Kubernetes things like ingresses do understand do actually do uh, high availability. They'll know when one of the web servers is down and stop routing to it. And uh, you know, and they'll also they'll do status checks too, which is a big part of it. The high HA proxy and other uh, other other high availability load balancers like that. Um, so yeah, this is you know this is the complete pulp high availability setup. It's completely it's high availability available, and it supports every single content type. So, uh, you know, how I want to thank people who helped us get this state, particularly, uh, you know, Giannis, uh, his uh, nickname is Spreadsy. Um, he helped me redesign the installer for a service oriented architecture to make, to basically make, avoid these pointless dependencies between roles. Um, this, uh, the, you know, so that, you know, if you, you can specify, you can put like Postgres on a server without the rest of pulp on it, for example. That was a previous, uh, or, I don't think that was the deck definition, but there were things like that that were just pointlessly coupled. Um, and uh, cl clustering uh, support config in Nginx that was also implemented recently. It uses the, uh, like I said, uses the Nginx module called Upstream uh, to do this. Um, and we have partial key support in the sense that you can install pulp uh, and it'll put the keys on multiple nodes, but there's still some missing features. I think. Um, these two keys are the web server TLS key and certificate, as well as the token authentication key, which is used by uh, some content types. And it's implemented on the API nodes typically. But there is still work remaining. Um, we want to do with CI with multiple containers. Currently, our CI tests, uh, they test like multiple distros, but we want to do one either with multiple containers, the same distro, or just, hey, let's do, why not, why not make each of those services a different in each of those uh, each of those like a different distros that'd be a way of killing great way of implementing uh testing two birds with one <laughs> stone i guess um uh fully implement shared private keys like i mentioned earlier and i also want to verify that uh, open source so nginx has a commercial like subscription or the open source version and the open source version has passive health checks. I want, I'm hoping these are sufficient, but you know, I'd have to verify that because the commercial version does have a better active pass uh, health checks. Of course, if you're using Kubernetes operator or you know, this would if you're using Kubernetes operator, I do believe this take uh, I have to, this I think this would be taken care of, but still, I'd have to double check that. Um, um and of course, there's lots of documentation uh, to update as well. We've we've already done some of the docs though. We've already provided uh, like an example called deployment scenarios that shows uh, some of these already. So, thank you very much. I'm, I think Brian and I are ready to, to answer questions now. Thank you, Mike. So, has anyone questions for Brian or Mike? Anyone watching on the live stream as well? Um, I have a question. Um, first of all, thank you for the great presentation. I think it's very interesting. Um, the question I have is, um, it's very great to understand how to make an HA deployment. Uh, however, as it has been mentioned previously, the web server configuration is very important. and um, Lately, I've been working on some performance uh, issues, and so far it all boiled down to the misconfigured Nginx and the proxy web server. And so having that said, do we plan to provide some, I don't know, tuning guidelines or some sort of recommendations so people, you know, whenever they do this uh, cluster setup, don't spend too much time uh, figuring this all issues uh, whenever they come? but to configure the web server in a way so it's configured in a balanced way. Yeah, that's definitely what we need to do. Um, 
I think that kind of it breaks down to two pieces and we should prioritize doing that. And I also appreciate all the performance investigation you've been doing. And I agree that the tuning there is, is key um, for the user experience. So anyways, the two pieces I think we should do are we need to have great defaults. And I think that we should revisit our defaults. Um, but also, I think we want to, um, uh, in, a, in a concise way, try to unpack what the significant tunings are in some sort of a tunings guide. Um, something that's brief would be helpful. Like, I need, I mean, I would just love the way the PyTest does their documentation after just reading it a whole bunch. There's this, like, examples and fact area of their site. And it's got like a hundred like questions, like I need to do this. And then it has like three sentences of an answer. And so I want to, I would love to see a tuning guide of something like that. Yep, I, I agree with that totally. I just want to add one thing, you know, the installer, I do generally try to provide the easiest user experience by auto detecting things. If I can auto detect something, I will probably uh, use that. Like I can count the number of cores easily with Ansible and make that a very uh, uh, tune based on that. But users can still override it. It would be auto or specify value. Yeah, that would greatly help and simplify. However, some other values like, I don't know, number of uh, worker connections or the read timeout or send timeout, this is all basically dependent on what kind of setup it meant to be. Uh, whether there will be like a lot of users who are going to sync or pull, you know, and so like not everyone is born to be a sysadmin or DevOps to figure out all these things in one day. <laughs> and yeah, so I I, think I, providing some tuning guide will definitely help our users where we would basically try to help them to put them on the correct path, like saying, if you plan to have this sort of user base, you might want to do this. If you plan to have some other user base, you might want to look into this engine section to tune this sort of values. And so when and if we're going to do this, when we're going to do this, and what kind of criteria we're going to use for this tuning guide. Or this is too specific question to be answered. No, I, I don't think it is. I think it's just that um, you know, I we should prioritize it, and I think it comes down to kind of time and priorities. And this this is, I think, in the maturity of Pulp's history, this is the right kind of a activity for us to be doing, or you know, around, you know, in the upper uh, upper tens of the Pulp three release line. So let's do it. Let's make a tuning guide. Um, I also think that we could do a little, we would do well to put in some kind of um, self monitoring helpful hints. Like if Django's response starts to take, uh, for API requests, takes longer than, say, a second, that is not a good situation. We should be logging about that. And people should be using Prometheus and Grafana, but we should at least be logging. Um, or, you know, anyways, there are things that we can do. Or if your task wait times are just really large, we should be logging about that. So anyways, uh, let's go on and hear from, I think, Grant, you are the next uh, to raise your hand. Grant. Sure. Uh, thanks. This is, uh, this is great. Uh, this is, I love everything about this. Um, just one comment about things that, that um, have bitten us, not us pulp, but us Red Hat in other environments with tuning guides like this, especially when you're clustering, is there's how do you tune your workload to in the individual server pieces? And then there's the cross server piece places, like having a highly available clustered front end from Nginx down to the workers is great. But if you have a single Postgres node, then you, you reach a point where adding workers absolutely kills you because you run out of connections to your database. And that's a second level of tuning that where the individual pieces can affect each other. Um, and it's really hard to come up with a, with a general purpose response at that level because it starts getting dependent very much on your workload and, and what you've done um, to the, the more foreground, if you will, pieces parts. 
um, but it's definitely something to think about when tuning is is your is the bottleneck at the database level is something a lot of people forget about and then for things like the content app bottlenecks at the disk io level is also a, a second third order kind of a problem that a lot of people don't think about and even if all we do is mention that in the tuning guide it can it can go a long way to helping to ina's point helping people go oh oh there's another place i have to look to see why my performance isn't what i expect but this is this is great stuff yeah that all sounds um uh, very very cogent grant i agree with all that um, thank you for sharing that. Um, let's yes, hear I from do. Elijah. OK, so ignore me if this is ignorant. But I guess the, the what I'm trying to figure out is how this applies to the containerized deployment like managed by the operator. Is Has there been significant changes to the operator-based deployment to make it more HA in quotes? Uh, I don't know. I'll stop there. No, that's a great question. Um, and I think that we would need to defer to Fabricio, um, who's, uh, and maybe Mike, maybe you may know as well, but um, Mike or Fabricio, who work closely with the pulp operator, would, I think, be in the best position against that. So would either of you like to take a stab at it? So when I worked on Pulp Operator uh, heavily in 2019, and you know, and I've and I've been uh, like, and I've been paying attention to some of the changes since then, but not all the changes since then. Um, you know, it is significantly more HA. Like if I go to the let me go bring up my slides of like stuff that I've done and haven't done yet. Um, it, so if you were to use the operator right now, you know, it would, and you had your separate Postgres and Redis, and you didn't use the Postgres and Redis provided by the operator, like it would, you know, it would look like this basically. Um, uh, and this was also assumed that your cluster has something like HA proxy, but or a, 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 or an ingress or route basically, but it's all. But the whole point of Kubernetes is plugging in your preferred architecture, plugging in your preferred storage, plugging in your you know preferred uh, like load load balancer. In terms of the stuff that's been done, I mean yeah, it has an SOA, it has the it has the it has the clustering support in, in Nginx. The key support, I don't think the I don't think all the key, I have to double check whether all the key support is implemented in Nadi yet. Um, one area one area that I know that we need to do more of to support that use case. Um, so, I mean, just to be um, totally, in my opinion, transparent and upfront, I don't think that we're there yet. Um, and so we're, we're gonna have to find all the ways that we need to get there. Yeah, yeah. I, guess, I guess my question is, is that like, obviously uh, it's already designed that you have multiple content pods and multiple, like you could have multiple web pods, right? But this is Correct. all assuming co-located on the same cluster, probably on the same node, or you know, like it's yeah. not. Because I guess this is what one of my questions is: the whole point, given the like uh, satellite application of Pulp, is that you the HA thing needs to be distributed, right? Where you might have content <laughs> pods very far away from each other. Yep. Right. Yeah, so um, you're getting to an area that I had uh, wanted to include, but then forgot, um, which is uh, a, 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 probably the number one question that I get about HA is, can I spread my components? Like, OK, it's clustered, got it. Can I spread those services across LAN links? Can I put one in data center one and one in data center two? And whether that's in Kubernetes with pods and different availability zones or Amazon Web Services or my own data centers connected through VPNs, um, can I do that? And generally, I tell them no. So you might wonder then, well, how is this possibly HA? Um, and uh, I think we need to do some more testing because my, my default answer is kind of on the safe side. Um, where I say, no, 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 don't send your stuff over the WAN. And it's not that Pulp doesn't 
like that. Pulp doesn't really care. It can its network requirements are not that much um, relative to the the WAN requirements from syncing content, for instance, um, from like CDNs and stuff like that. But um, but I do think that it actually would work, practically speaking, very well if, for instance, you were doing this on Amazon or or Azure, because their availability zones are designed with such low latency in between them that that I think would work quite well. So I think it kind of matters in terms of what your network is. And that's where we need to really sit down and do some testing, I think, to see, okay, like how much latency is okay. And it's really comes down to connections to Postgres and connections to the file, the cluster file system, which you really should just be using object storage anyway. Um, so I think we need to do some testing there, but, um, to just bring this back up to just a high level statement, the only way that this HA narrative is reliable is if they can be spread across different availability zones. And what I typically tell people to do today, just because we haven't done all that testing, is don't don't try to put them in different availability zones. Actually set up two independent pulp installations, one in each of your data centers, and do replication between them, which replication being like perform a natural sync, which is just a normal sync, <laughs> where you're syncing content from one pulp into another because pulp is very efficient at um, at receiving content. But, but in that case, they have different databases. And they do have, yeah. Part of pulp, but they sync. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay, exactly. So and it sounds yeah. to me like I'm confused because it's not totally clear. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly correct. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's, uh, that would that's very accurate. Yeah, um, right. like what like what we built is is technology that allows you know has the right architecture diagrams, but that is not the same thing as this is a bulletproof HA system. Like there's a hundred ways to die in HA still, and we need to I think really do that work to make sure that it's um, as bulletproof as our user and communities require it to be. I also want to point out one thing I think we can do currently. I'm fairly certain we could put, if you're using object storage, you could put the content serving nodes and the and the and the web servers in like different in different uh, sites, different WAN across WAN locations. And I'm pretty sure that that would work very well. Or it's like you may have to say this web server only talks to these content servers and not these other content servers, but it can talk to like can talk to the, you might configure the web server to say talk to only the content servers in this zone, availability zone, but talk to the API server in the the primary zone, the primary zone that would have the API servers and the workers and and uh, and, and Postgres and Redis, you know, and that might actually be a very happy medium because most of your need for distributed load and low latency would be needed for content operations, not API operations. Does everybody? Does that sound correct to other people? Yeah, it, it sounds right, but I still kind of um, reduce the statement, not in a bad way, to we got to test it. Yeah, we definitely um, have to test it. We got to test it. We got to see how it works. And this is partly where I'm hoping that users can say, listen, I have a real need for this. I want to try it and then come and work with the, the developers in a collaborative way to help us um, go there together. That's what I hope happens. Why don't, um, Elijah, I hope we've done service to your question. Um, it's certainly not a confusion on your part, is my uh, take. I, I just have a, a very quick note. I think that diagram that Mike showed is exactly how the operator is right now. But I think the operator that Elijah knows is kind of outdated one where we will still had the resource manager. And that was an issue for the high availability. But now we address it. And it is right as in the bike slide. Cool. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, and maybe Fabricio or Melanie can share a link to Fabricio's um, operator talk from earlier in this week. Um, Elijah, definitely, you know how to reach out to us. Definitely come back with more questions. I really appreciate it. Um, 
we are a little bit short on time and I wanna make sure to hear from our next hand raised uh, person, Florian. Welcome. Can you hear me? It works great. Um, I just want to point out before optimizing HA in the operator um, and about the uh, services in Kubernetes that um, are currently not managed um, by the installer. There are um, perhaps operators that could be um, used for, here's one for Redis, and there's the other one for Postgres. So one could decide to um, pass on the um, responsibility on how that works. Um, that would mean obviously that um, uh, there cannot be predictions about their performance, but um, they would have to be measured. That would help in the sense that it would be much more the like of an installer I would think of, because it's something that Kubernetes pro provides already. Uh, yeah, Fabrizio, do you have any um, particular thoughts to share on that? If not, I can. Perhaps Fabrizio is finding the unmute button. Oh, there he is. Yeah, actually, I was like, I, I lost like half of the question. Could you please repeat? I, I think what I had heard Florian say, Florian, tell me if this is right, is that these links that he put into the chat are other operators that manage um, services like Redis and services like Postgres. And perhaps we would do well to use those instead of um, having our operator manage those services. And the question I guess that I have is it's not clear to me whether our operator tries to manage Redis and tries to manage Postgres or if it defers that to something else. Is that right, Florian? Um, I was kind of um, thinking in, in um, this area because um, I believe that was Tuesday or Monday, and uh, Matthias uh, was asking, I believe, um, Mike, if it is possible with the current operator to um, install multiple pulp instances. So that I, I was thinking. Now I'm making the connection between this question, um, our thing from yesterday, how to manage the tenancy, and now this optimization question. So it could be like a one string of, of goals in, in this line. If the operator can be made to um, install multiple instances of Pulp, and if it can defer its service needs, uh, service slash uh, high availability needs to the existing operators for the external services, it could be a good citizen in the Kubernetes world, uh, really, um, um, behave like um, a, a good installer. It could solve the multi multi tenancy things. And once that is kind of that tent is um, erected, there can be uh, measurements and optimizations in the HA world. And yeah, if I I think I answered your question about installing multiple pulp uh, instances on Kubernetes is. Our, when you install, we implemented a namespacing su support in the installer and in, in the operator. I mean, the, the operator can be namespaced. So you can now deploy the operator multiple times, but each operator manages a single cluster of pulp. And I think that's basically the design, uh, independent cluster of pulp. And that's basically the design of an operator is to manage, you know, the entire application. If you want an enti an enti another instance of the entire application, you spin up another operator. Is that correct, Fabrizio? Is that the design of namespacing in operators? Yeah, we, we currently just like namespace install the operator and we are like managing the Redis and Postgres container. And I think, yeah, it will, it will probably be trying to support these operators, but currently we are just uh, working with this uh managing these cool 
Uh, that's at least a clear state of the, the union, so to speak, in this area. Um, thank you for the feedback, Florian. Uh, we are at the end of our time here today. So um, I just want to thank you all for your participation and for Mike as um, co-presenter. And um, if you have more questions, please continue the conversation. Um, you can post comments on YouTube below, or you can um, reach out through the Matrix channels for more discussion. I really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank you.